Sarnangachami Tamang Sarnangachami Sangang Sarnangachami I go for refuge in the Buddha. I go for refuge in the Dharma. I go for refuge in the Sangha. Buddha Saranangacha. Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Thank you. Uh, as you're aware, and those of you who may be joining us online later, uh, Master Unsan could not be with us tonight. He was called away. Um, so we're continuing our practice. I'm Minwei Maitri, and uh, I'll be leading our practice tonight. So it's good to see that Mike's here. Mike, you're here just in time for us to begin our meditation. Uh, as we do uh, each week, we will uh, start with our 15 minutes of meditation practice.
So Mike and Robert, it's great to see you guys here. And uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, Master Unsan is away to this, this evening. Um, so you're stuck with me leading our practice, but I'm glad you guys are here. Hopefully it'll make it a little more interactive than just uh, me and Hangdal hanging out together. So appreciate you guys showing up. Um, so the next thing we do is uh, we share the uh, got on the opening of the sutras and uh, again I know most of you guys are familiar with this but here it is in front of you just in case you want to follow along this Dharma incomparably profound and minutely subtle is rarely encountered even in hundreds of thousands of millions of ages now we see it hear it hold and maintain it may we completely realize the true mind of all Buddhas So as uh, Master Unsan often says, sit back, relax. We're going to talk a little bit about the Dharma. Um, so uh, this is a one-stop shopping tonight. You guys get me for the whole event. But um, I'll try not to make it long because it's also a full moon uh, this week, and we will do the repentance uh, gata uh, at the end of our services today. Um, as I was thinking about in the past week what I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> um, I was really, I was really kind of inspired by uh, Johnson's talk last week when he talked about the ten thousand things, and I thought about, wow, I, you know, I really like this intersection between Buddhism and Taoism. Um, maybe I'll talk about just the concept of Wu or absence. Um, and I thought, you know, he he kind of he, he dwelt on that a little bit, talking about the ten thousand things, as the ten thousand things all. Um, all emerge from absence uh, so I thought where do I want to go with this and uh, so I thought about it for a while and I thought you know what I do want to talk about this intersection between Taoism and Buddhism um, perhaps because there was once in my mind this very relativistic idea uh, that Taoism was somehow separate from Buddhism. But you have to have a very dualistic thinking to think that. And in Zen we try to get past that dualistic thinking. Um, and so I decided, you know what, I think there's a great teaching that I used to chant quite frequently in another Sangha uh, that I wanted to share with you guys tonight. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So once upon a time there was this monk and he was I think the eighth Chinese patriarch uh, or the eighth Chinese ancestor um, and his name was Rockhead. Um, pretty good name I suppose. Uh, they didn't really call him Rockhead but that's what his name was. His name was Shi To. So Shi meaning stone uh, and To meaning head. So Shi To Shi Qian. Uh, and he was very famous in the Zen world, in, or is famous in the Zen world, for having written a poem. And the poem that he wrote, uh, in English, we know as the identity of the relative and absolute, or harmony of difference and sameness. It actually has a, a bunch of different translations because of the way the Chinese characters are written to describe the poem that he wrote. Um, but I'm going to chant that for you guys here in a little bit, uh, and I want to discuss a little bit about why. Um, so good old Stonehead or Rockhead, Shito, uh, was a very young man when Wei Neng, um, was the, um, was the patriarch or the, 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 the Zen master of the day, right? And, uh, so Wei Neng, who wrote the Platform Sutra, um, met this Shito Shichen when Shito was 12 or 13 years old and Shito had come to see Shito had come to see him and uh, <clears throat> and Wei Nung told him at the time he said you know if you follow me young man uh, you're going to wind up being as ugly as I am and Shito's answer was very simply 
that's great. And he's like, all right. Uh, and he did follow me, but only for one more year because a year later, uh, Hui Nung died. And you can tell the Platform Sutra and the teachings of Hui Nung had this uh, long lasting influence on Shito because the poem that he wrote um, talks a lot about the things that are in the Platform Sutra. And in, in, in order to fully understand what it is he's writing about when he talks about um, this relative and absolutism, when he talks about the northern and southern ancestors or patriarchs, uh, it all goes back to Hui Nung's teachings in the Platform Sutra. So while my intent was not to talk about the Platform Sutra, I encourage you to go back and look at it as we talk about um, as we talk about the identity of the relative and absolute poem, um, because you can't read the two separately. The two are really um, intertwined, as one is the teaching uh, of Hui Nung in the Platform Sutra, and then the other is the understanding that this younger Zen master, uh, later I think he was called the Eighth Ancestor, but he was really one of the founders of this uh, Kaodong school, um, which later became Soto Zen in Japan. Um, and so this identity of the relative and absolute is chanted every week in a Soto temple. Uh, and usually when uh, they do like a more memorial service for a for a Soto Zen uh, master who may have passed away. Uh, so um, they, this is a, a very commonly chanted, um, it's a very commonly chanted um, poem in, in a Soto temple. So let me see if I can expand this just a little bit, make sure I'm sharing the right one. You guys see this okay, where it says identity of the relative and absolute? Let me expand it a little bit. How's that? Robert, you give me a thumbs up. Is that okay? Is that visible? All right, good. Here we go. All right. So, um, again, I don't know if you guys have chanted this before. I'm going to chant it for you now. Um, but I ask you to follow it along. You don't have to chant with me if you don't want to. Um, and I can send this to you guys in a PDF. Uh, there's a couple of versions, as I mentioned, because of the translation of it. Uh, this is the one that I learned to chant uh, years ago. Um, so I find it's a little bit easier to chant, though the translations are not always the same. Um, but anyway, if you'll bear with me, I will chant this one. Um, and then we'll get going here. Identity of the relative and absolute, the mind of the great sage of India was intimately conveyed from west to east among human beings or wise men and fools but in the way there is no northern or southern patriarch the subtle source is clear and bright the tributary streams flow through the darkness to be attached to things is illusion to encounter the absolute is not yet enlightenment each and all the subjective and objective spheres are related and at the same time independent related yet working differently though each keeps its own place 
place. Form makes the character and appearance different. Sounds distinguish comfort and discomfort. The dark makes all words one. The brightness distinguishes good and bad phrases. The four elements return to their nature as a child to its mother. Fire is hot, wind moves, water is wet. Earth hard, I see, ears hear, nose smells, tongue taste. The salt and sour, each is independent of the other. Cause and effect must return to the great reality. The words high and low are used relatively. Within light there is darkness, but do not try to understand that darkness. Within darkness there is light, but do not look for that light. Light and darkness are a pair like the foot before and the foot behind. In walking each thing has its own intrinsic value and is related to everything else in function and position. In airy life fits the absolute as a box and its lid. The absolute works together with the relative like two arrows meeting in midair. Reading words you should grasp the great reality. Do not judge by any standards if you do not see the way you do not see it even as you walk on it when you walk the way it is not clear near it is not far if you are deluded you are mountains and rivers away from it i respectfully say to those who wish to be enlightened do not waste your time by night or day So you see the, the concepts that uh, Xi Qing brings up here. Uh, everything is separate, yet everything is together. Everything is interrelated, and yet everything is also interdependent and independent. So he brings up these concepts of things. Um, and he talks about like two arrows meeting or, or the absolute and the relative playing a role together. And I always think of um, a bowl. Let me take this if you can see this. Uh, so I have a bowl here, okay? So let's take the bowl is empty, right? It has a hard shell on the outside, but the hard shell by itself means nothing unless it's empty so there is this concept that the that the form of this requires the emptiness in order to be complete think as you if you would of a window the frame of the window is the window but without that emptiness in between you can't see out it it's just a wall that's what Shito Sichian is talking about here. There's this interworking, this interrelationship between all things relative and all things absolute. And we have to learn to get past this always seeing things as separate, always seeing things as one or the other, and begin to see them as interrelated. Interdependency, which is not a real word, uh, but Shunryu uh, Suzuki, Suzuki um, used that word to try to uh, convey the concept that things can be independent but totally dependent. 
So he would say interdependency. Uh, again, it was a made-up word, but the concept is there to try to teach a point. Um, so anyway, if you haven't chanted that before, uh, I wanted to kind of expose it to some people who haven't seen it before. Uh, I also, if I can pull it real quickly, there are there are lots of, as I mentioned before, there are lots of different translations for this. Uh, as as I chanted, uh, I chanted it because the way I learned it was uh, the identity of the relative and absolute. But um, if I can share this real quickly, you see this is the translated copy here. Um, and uh, this one is called the Harmony of Difference and Sameness. It begins the same way. Of course, the mind of the great sage of India, they're talking about uh, the Sakyamuni Buddha. Um, and then, you know, I find it very interesting that it was intimately transmitted from west to east. Of course, that intimately transmitted part is very much the Zen concept of mind-to-mind -mind transmission. Um, but it talks about from west to east. But of course, then uh, further down at the bottom, it talks about all things are just relative, right? Um, that light and darkness are just relative. Um, hot and cold are relative, whatever. And west to east is relative, right? So, uh, again, I'm happy to share that with you guys. If anybody wants it, I'm happy to email it out to you. There's a couple of different versions of, of this poem. Again, it was not originally written as a, as a chant. It was a poem. Uh, and the intellectuals of, of, of ancient Zen in China um, really delved into this uh, artwork of, of words, calligraphy, um, paintings. Um, and so this was just one expression from this Zen master. Into the form of a poem. So, uh, anyway, I, I share that with you guys tonight because uh, I think that's a, a prime example of, of some groups of, of Zen, in this case, Soto Zen uh, or Kaodong Zen. Um, they don't do the koans that we do in the Linji uh, tradition. Um, they believe in this uh, silent illumination, as it's called that enlightenment can occur just through silent meditation, right? Uh, and yet they're talking, this whole poem is about, there is no northern or southern ancestor. Koans are not necessarily the, only, the right way and silent illumination or silent zazen is the wrong way. There's only one way, right? And the, how we come to that one way uh, is how we see our own truths, how we see our one true mind. Uh, as we talk about. So thank you guys. Okay, so with that we'll go back to our uh, second 15 minutes of meditation.
Okay, um, we will now do the Heart Sutra. And I'll share that on the screen there so you guys can all see it if you uh, don't have it memorized or don't have it up in front of you. <clears throat> the Maha. of merit if I can uh, try to do the bell properly. All sentient beings are one seamless body and pass quickly from birth to death. 
We remember those who cared for us and are gone, those who are ill, those who are at war, who are hungry and who are in pain. May they heal and have peace. We especially dedicate our service to Mike Gingy Wood, Kim Hawkins, anyone else? Uh, Ronnie Koenig and Emily Epstein. Dave and the EJ and her father. One for some of my uh, friends back home and uh, one for the people of Palestine. Thank you. All beings in the ten directions, subject to the greed, hatred, and delusions of themselves and others. All Buddhas throughout space and time, all honored ones, bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, wisdom beyond wisdom, maha prajna paramita. We will now do our faith and practice vow. I will never retreat and will be firm in my mind in this correct dharma. I will escape from the samsaric cycle of birth and death and definitely will see my original face. I will be sure to inherit the life of insight of the Buddha and save all sentient beings. Brother Hengdahl? Since you shared the sameness of relative and absolute tonight, I will use the form I used in the liturgy for my practice. The spiritual source finds clear in the light. The branching streams flow on in the dark. Infinite realms of light and dark convey the Buddha mind. Birds and trees and stars, and we ourselves come forth in perfect harmony. We practice and recite this for all beings, and grateful thanks for many guides along the way. Thank you. For those who don't get the ref who don't get the reference, the branching streams is a is a part of the uh, har the harmony of of difference and sameness uh, and there's a book by Shunra Suzuki about that so I can actually share that with you guys too okay and so uh, before we get to our repentance we will do the four great bodhisattva vows <coughs> sentient beings are numberless we vow to help them all delusions are countless we vow to see through them all Opportunities to awaken are infinite. We vow to embrace them all. The Buddha way is endless. We vow to embody it. Now, uh, we're just about out of time, and that's all right. We will uh, do two more things here, the great admonition and the repenting of the ten evil actions. <clears throat> Life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly by, and opportunities to awaken are easily lost. Strive to realize your true nature. Do not squander your time by night or day. And finally, our repentance uh, from the ten evil actions. Again, it's the full moon um, and Wanji, uh, our great ancestor, um, always loved doing this. So here we go. <clears throat> Repenting from the ten evil actions. This moment, I repent from the serious transgressions of taking any life, taking things not given, misconduct done in lust, false speech, taking intoxicants to produce heedlessness, discussing the faults of others, praising my own works, clinging and stinginess, wrathful anger, slandering the three jewels. May all offenses accumulated during hundreds of eons now be totally consumed in an instant as fire burns dry grass, extinguishing all things until nothing remains. Our offenses have no self-nature, but arise only from our minds. If our minds are extinguished, 
then our offenses too will be destroyed. When both our minds and our offenses are extinguished, and both are seen as empty, this is termed the true repentance. I will now extinguish the candles. Thank you guys for all joining us tonight.